Chapter Six of the Oregon Trail. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Oregon Trail by Francis Parkman Jr. Chapter Six: The Platte and the Desert. We were now arrived at the close of our solitary journeyings along the St. Joseph's Trail. On the evening of the twenty-third of May, we encamped near its junction with the old legitimate trail of the Oregon emigrants. We had ridden long that afternoon, trying in vain to find wood and water, until at length we saw the sunset sky reflected from a pool encircled by bushes and a rock or two. The water lay in the bottom of a hollow, the smooth prairie gracefully rising in ocean-like swells on every side. We pitched our tents by it, not, however, before the keen eye of Henry Chatillon had discerned some unusual object upon the faintly defined outline of the distant swell but in the moist hazy atmosphere of the evening nothing could be clearly distinguished as we lay around the fire after supper a low and distant sound strange enough amid the loneliness of the prairie reached our ears peals of laughter and the faint voices of men and women for eight days we had not encountered a human being and this singular warning of their vicinity had an effect extremely wild and impressive about dark a sallow-faced fellow descended the hill on horseback and splashing through the pool rode up to the tents he was enveloped in a huge cloak and his broad felt hat was weeping about his ears with the drizzling moisture of the evening another followed a stout square-built intelligent-looking man who announced himself as leader of an emigrant party encamped a mile in advance of us about twenty wagons he said were with him the rest of his party were on the other side of the big blue, waiting for a woman who was in the pains of childbirth, and quarreling, meanwhile, among themselves. These were the first emigrants that we had overtaken, although we had found abundant and melancholy traces of their progress throughout the whole course of the journey. Sometimes we passed the grave of one who had sickened and died on the way. The earth was usually torn up and covered thickly with wolf tracks. Some had escaped this violation. One morning a piece of plank standing upright on the summit of a grassy hill attracted our notice, and riding up to it we found the following words very roughly traced upon it, apparently by a red-hot piece of iron. Mary Ellis, died May 7, 1845, aged two months. Such tokens were of common occurrence. Nothing could speak more for the hardihood or rather infatuation of the adventurers, or the sufferings that await them upon the journey. We were late in breaking up our camp on the following morning, and scarcely had we ridden a mile when we saw far in advance of us, drawn against the horizon, a line of objects stretching at regular intervals along the level edge of the prairie. An intervening swell soon hid them from sight, until, ascending it a quarter of an hour after, we saw close before us the emigrant caravan, with its heavy white wagons creeping on in their slow procession, and a large drove of cattle following behind. Half a dozen yellow-visaged Missourians mounted on horseback were cursing and shouting among them, their lank angular proportions enveloped in brown homespun, evidently cut and adjusted by the hands of a domestic female tailor. As we approached, they greeted us with a polished salutation, how are you, boys? Are you for Oregon or California? As we pushed rapidly past the wagons, children's faces were thrust out from the white coverings to look at us, while the careworn, thin-featured matron, or the buxom girl seated in front, suspended the knitting on which most of them were engaged to stare at us with wondering curiosity. By the side of each wagon stalked the proprietor, urging on his patient oxen who shouldered heavily along inch by inch on their interminable journey. It was easy to see that fear and dissension prevailed among them. Some of the men, but these with one exception were bachelors, looked wistfully upon us as we rode lightly and swiftly past, and then impatiently at their own lumbering wagons and heavy-gated oxen. Others were unwilling to advance at all until the party they had left behind should have rejoined them. Many were murmuring against the leader they had chosen and wished to depose him, and this discontent was fermented by some ambitious spirits who had hopes of succeeding in his place. The women were divided between regrets for the homes they had left 
and apprehension of the deserts and the savages before them. We soon left them far behind, and fondly hoped that we had taken a final leave, but unluckily our companion's wagon stuck so long in a deep muddy ditch that, before it was extricated, the van of the emigrant caravan appeared again descending a ridge close at hand. Wagon after wagon plunged through the mud, and as it was nearly noon, and the place promised shade and water, we saw with much gratification that they were resolved to encamp. Soon the wagons were wheeled into a circle, the cattle were grazing over the meadow, and the men, with sour, sullen faces, were looking about for wood and water. They seemed to meet with but indifferent success. As we left the ground, I saw a tall, slouching fellow with a nasal accent of down east, contemplating the contents of his tin cup, which he had just filled with water. "'Look here, you,' he said. "'It's chock full of animals.' The cup, as he held it out, exhibited, in fact, an extraordinary variety and profusion of animal and vegetable life. Riding up the little hill and looking back on the meadow, we could easily see that all was not right in the camp of the emigrants. The men were crowded together, and an angry discussion seemed to be going forward. R. was missing from his wonted place in the line, and the captain told us that he had remained behind to get his horse shod by a blacksmith who was attached to the emigrant party. Something whispered in our ears that mischief was on foot. We kept on, however, and coming soon to a stream of tolerable water, we stopped to rest and dine. Still the absentee lingered behind. At last, at the distance of a mile, he and his horse suddenly appeared, sharply defined against the sky on the summit of a hill and close behind a huge white object rose slowly into view. What is that blockhead bringing with him now? A moment dispelled the mystery. Slowly and solemnly, one behind the other, four long trains of oxen and four emigrant wagons rolled over the crest of the declivity and gravely descended, while R. rode in state in the van. It seems that, during the process of shoeing the horse, the smothered dissensions among the emigrants suddenly broke into open rupture. Some insisted on pushing forward, some on remaining where they were, and some on going back. Kersley, their captain, threw up his command in disgust. "'And now, boys,' said he, "'if any of you are for going ahead, just you come along with me.' Four wagons, with ten men, one woman and one small child, made up the force of the go-ahead faction, and R., with his usual proclivity toward mischief, invited them to join our party. Fear of the Indians, for I can conceive of no other motive, must have induced him to court so burdensome an alliance. As may well be conceived, these repeated instances of high-handed dealing sufficiently exasperated us. In this case, indeed, the men who joined us were all that could be desired, rude indeed in manner, but frank, manly, and intelligent. To tell them we could not travel with them was, of course, out of the question. I merely reminded Kearsley that if his oxen could not keep up with our mules, he must expect to be left behind, as we could not consent to be further delayed on the journey. But he immediately replied that his oxen should keep up, and if they couldn't, why he allowed that he'd find out how to make em. Having availed myself of what satisfaction could be derived from giving R to understand my opinion of his conduct, I returned to our side of the camp. On the next day, as it chanced, our English companions broke the axle-tree of their wagon, and down came the whole cumbrous machine lumbering into the bed of a brook. Here was a day's work cut out for us. Meanwhile, our emigrant associates kept on their way, and so vigorously did they urge forward their powerful oxen that, with the broken axle-tree and other calamities, it was full a week before we overtook them. When at length we discovered them, one afternoon, crawling quietly along the sandy brink of the plat. But meanwhile, various incidents occurred to ourselves. It was probable that at this stage of our journey the Pawnees would attempt to rob us. We began, therefore, to stand guard in turn, dividing the night into three watches, and appointing two men for each. Delorier and I held guard together. We did not march with military precision to and fro before the tents, 
our discipline was by no means so stringent and rigid. We wrapped ourselves in our blankets and sat down by the fire, and Delorier, combining his culinary functions with his duties as sentinel, employed himself in boiling the head of an antelope for our morning's repast. Yet we were models of vigilance in comparison with some of the party, for the ordinary practice of the guard was to establish himself in the most comfortable posture he could, lay his rifle on the ground, and, enveloping his nose in the blanket, meditate on his mistress or whatever subject best pleased him. This is all well enough when among Indians who do not habitually proceed further in their hostility than robbing travelers of their horses and mules, though indeed a Pawnee's forbearance is not always to be trusted. But in certain regions farther to the west, the guard must beware how he exposes his person to the light of the fire, lest perchance some keen-eyed skulking marksman should let fly a bullet or an arrow from amid the darkness. Among various tales that circulated around our campfire was a rather curious one told by Boisvert, and not inappropriate here. Boisvert was trapping with several companions on the skirts of the Blackfoot country. The man on guard, well knowing that it behooved him to put forth his utmost precaution, kept aloof from the firelight, and sat watching intently on all sides. At length he was aware of a dark, crouching figure stealing noiselessly into the circle of the light. He hastily cocked his rifle, but the sharp click of the lock caught the ear of Blackfoot, whose senses were all on the alert. Raising his arrow, already fitted to the string, he shot in the direction of the sound. So sure was his aim that he drove it through the throat of the unfortunate guard, and then, with a loud yell, bounded from the camp. As I looked at the partner of my watch puffing and blowing over his fire, it occurred to me that he might not prove the most efficient auxiliary in time of trouble. Delorier, said I, would you run away if the Pawnees should fire at us? Ah, oui, oui, monsieur, he replied very decisively. I did not doubt the fact, but was a little surprised at the frankness of the confession. At this instant a most whimsical variety of voices— Barks, howls, yelps, and whines, all mingled as it were together, sounded from the prairie not far off, as if a whole conclave of wolves of every age and sex were assembled there. Delorier looked up from his work with a laugh, and began to imitate this curious medley of sounds with a most ludicrous accuracy. At this they were repeated with redoubled emphasis, the musician being apparently indignant at the successful efforts of a rival. They all proceeded from the throat of one little wolf, not larger than a spaniel, seated by himself at some distance. He was of the species called the prairie wolf, a grim-visaged but harmless little brute, whose worst propensity is creeping among horses and gnawing the ropes of rawhide by which they are picketed around the camp. But other beasts roam the prairies, far more formidable in aspect and character. These are the large white and gray wolves, whose deep howl we heard at intervals from far and near. At last I fell into a doze, and awakening from it found Delorier fast asleep. Scandalized by this breach of discipline, I was about to stimulate his vigilance by stirring him with the stock of my rifle, but, compassion prevailing, I determined to let him sleep a while, and then to arouse him, and administer a suitable reproof for such a forgetfulness of duty. Now and then I walked the rounds among the silent horses to see that all was right. The night was chill, damp, and dark, the dank grass bending under the icy dewdrops. At the distance of a rod or two the tents were invisible, and nothing could be seen but the obscure figures of the horses, deeply breathing and restlessly starting as they slept, or still slowly chopping the grass. Far off, beyond the black outline of the prairie, there was a ruddy light, gradually increasing, like the glow of a conflagration, until at length the broad disk of the moon, blood-red and vastly magnified by the vapors, rose slowly upon the darkness, flecked by one or two little clouds, and as the light poured over the gloomy plain, a fierce and stern howl close at hand seemed to greet it as an unwelcome intruder. There was something impressive and awful in the place and the hour, for I and the beasts were all that had consciousness for many a league around. 
Some days elapsed and brought us near the plat. Two men on horseback approached us one morning, and we watched them with the curiosity and interest that, upon the solitude of the plains, such an encounter always excites. They were evidently whites from their mode of riding, though contrary to the usage of that region, neither of them carried a rifle. Fools, remarked Henry Chatillon, to ride that way on the prairie. Pawnee find them, then they catch it. Pawnee had found them, and they had come very near catching it. Indeed, nothing saved them from trouble but the approach of our party. Shaw and I knew one of them, a man named Turner, whom we had seen at Westport. He and his companion belonged to an emigrant party and camped a few miles in advance, and had returned to look for some stray oxen, leaving their rifles, with characteristic rashness or ignorance, behind them. Their neglect had nearly cost them dear, for just before we came up, half a dozen Indians approached, and seeing them apparently defenseless, one of the rascals seized the bridle of Turner's fine horse and ordered him to dismount. Turner was wholly unarmed, but the other jerked a little revolving pistol out of his pocket, at which the pawnee recoiled, and just then, some of our men appearing in the distance, the whole party whipped their rugged little horses and made off. In no way daunted, Turner foolishly persisted in going forward. Long after leaving him, and late this afternoon, in the midst of a gloomy and barren prairie, we came suddenly upon the great Pawnee Trail leading from their villages on the Platte to their war and hunting grounds to the southward. Here every summer pass the motley concourse, thousands of savages, men, women, and children, horses and mules, laden with their weapons and implements, and an innumerable multitude of unruly wolfish dogs, who have not acquired the civilized accomplishment of barking, but howl like their wild cousins of the prairie. The permanent winter villages of the Pawnees stand on the lower plat, but throughout the summer the greater part of the inhabitants are wandering over the plains, a treacherous, cowardly banditti, who by a thousand acts of pillage and murder have deserved summary chastisement at the hands of government. Last year a Dakota warrior performed a signal exploit at one of these villages. He approached it alone in the middle of a dark night, and clambering up the outside of one of the lodges, which are in the form of a half-sphere, he looked in at the round hole made at the top for the escape of smoke. The dusky light from the smoldering embers showed him the forms of the sleeping inmates, and dropping lightly through the opening, he unsheathed his knife and, stirring the fire, coolly selected his victims. One by one he stabbed and scalped them, when a child suddenly awoke and screamed. He rushed from the lodge, yelled a Sioux war cry, shouted his name in triumph and defiance, and in a moment had darted out upon the dark prairie, leaving the whole village behind him in a tumult, with the howling and baying of dogs, the screams of women, and the yells of the enraged warriors. Our friend Kersley, as we learned on rejoining him, signalized himself by a less bloody achievement. He and his men were good woodsmen, and well skilled in the use of the rifle, but found themselves wholly out of their element on the prairie. None of them had ever seen a buffalo, and they had very vague conceptions of his nature and appearance. On the day after they reached the Platte, looking toward a distant swell, they beheld a multitude of little black specks in motion upon its surface. "'Take your rifles, boys,' said Kersley, "'and we'll have fresh meat for supper.' This inducement was quite sufficient. The ten men left their wagons and set out in hot haste, some on horseback and some on foot, in pursuit of the supposed buffalo. Meanwhile a high grassy ridge shut the game from view but mounting it after half an hour's running and riding, they found themselves suddenly confronted by about thirty mounted Pawnees. The amazement and consternation were mutual. Having nothing but their bows and arrows, the Indians thought their hour was come, and the fate that they were no doubt conscious of richly deserving about to overtake them. So they began, one and all, to shout forth the most cordial salutations of friendship, running up with extreme earnestness to shake hands with the Missourians, who were as much rejoiced as they were to escape the expected conflict. A low, undulating line of sand hills bounded the horizon before us. That day we rode ten consecutive hours, 
and it was dusk before we entered the hollows and gorges of these gloomy little hills. At length we gained the summit, and the long-expected valley of the Platte lay before us. We all drew rein, and, gathering in a knot on the crest of the hill, sat joyfully looking down upon the prospect. It was right welcome, strange, too, and striking to the imagination, and yet it had not one picturesque or beautiful feature, nor had it any of the features of grandeur other than its vast extent, its solitude, and its wilderness. For league after league a plain as level as a frozen lake was outspread beneath us. Here and there the plat, divided into a dozen thread-like sluices, was traversing it, and an occasional clump of wood, rising in the midst like a shadowy island, relieved the monotony of the waste. No living thing was moving throughout the vast landscape, except the lizards that darted over the sand and through the rank grass and prickly pear just at our feet. And yet stern and wild associations gave a singular interest to the view, for here each man lives by the strength of his arm and the valor of his heart. Here society is reduced to its original elements, the whole fabric of art and conventionality is struck rudely to pieces, and men find themselves suddenly brought back to the wants and resources of their original natures. We had passed the more toilsome and monotonous part of the journey, but four hundred miles still intervened between us and Fort Laramie, and to reach that point cost us the travel of three additional weeks. During the whole of this time we were passing up the center of a long, narrow, sandy plain, reaching like an outstretched belt nearly to the Rocky Mountains. Two lines of sand hills, broken often into the wildest and most fantastic forms, flanked the valley at the distance of a mile or two on the right and left, while beyond them lay a barren, trackless waste, the great American desert extending for hundreds of miles to the Arkansas on the one side and the Missouri on the other. Before us and behind us the level monotony of the plain was unbroken as far as the eye could reach. Sometimes it glared in the sun, an expanse of hot, bare sand. Sometimes it was veiled by long, coarse grass. Huge skulls and whitening bones of buffalo were scattered everywhere. The ground was tracked by myriads of them, and often covered with the circular indentations where the bulls had wallowed in hot weather. From every gorge and ravine, opening from the hills, descended deep, well-worn paths, where the buffalo issued twice a day in regular procession down to drink in the plat. The river itself runs through the midst, a thin sheet of rapid, turbid water half a mile wide, and scarce two feet deep. Its low banks, for the most part without a bush or a tree, are of loose sand, with which the stream is so charged that it grates on the teeth in drinking. The naked landscape is of itself dreary and monotonous enough, and yet the wild beasts and wild men that frequent the valley of the Platte make it a scene of interest and excitement to the traveler. Of those who have journeyed there, scarce one perhaps fails to look back with fond regret to his horse and his rifle. Early in the morning after we reached the Platte, a long procession of squalid savages approached our camp. Each was on foot, leading his horse by a rope of bullhide. His attire consisted merely of a scanty cincture and an old buffalo robe, tattered and begrimed by use, which hung over his shoulders. His head was close-shaven, except a ridge of hair reaching over the crown from the center of the forehead, very much like the long bristles on the back of a hyena and he carried his bow and arrows in his hand, while his meager little horse was laden with dried buffalo meat, the produce of his hunting. Such were the first specimens that we met, and very indifferent ones they were, of the genuine savages of the prairie. They were the Pawnees whom Kearsley had encountered the day before, and belonged to a large hunting party known to be ranging the prairie in the vicinity. They strode rapidly past within a furlong of our tents, not pausing or looking toward us, after the manner of Indians, when meditating mischief or conscious of ill desert. I went out and met them, and had an amicable conference with the chief, presenting him with half a pound of tobacco, at which unmerited bounty he expressed much gratification. These fellows, or some of their companions, had committed a dastardly outrage upon an emigrant party in advance of us, 
Two men out on horseback at a distance were seized by them, but lashing their horses they broke loose and fled. At this the Pawnees raised the yell and shot at them, transfixing the hindermost through the back with several arrows, while his companion galloped away and brought in the news to his party. The panic-stricken emigrants remained for several days in camp, not daring even to send out in quest of the dead body. The reader will recollect Turner, the man whose narrow escape was mentioned not long since. We heard that the men, whom the entreaties of his wife induced to go in search of him, found him leisurely driving along his recovered oxen and whistling in utter contempt of the Pawnee nation. His party was encamped within two miles of us, but we passed them that morning while the men were driving in the oxen and the women packing their domestic utensils and their numerous offspring in the spacious patriarchal wagons. As we looked back, we saw their caravan dragging its slow length along the plain, wearily toiling on its way to found new empires in the West. Our New England climate is mild and equable compared with that of the Platte. This very morning, for instance, was close and sultry, the sun rising with a faint oppressive heat, when suddenly darkness gathered in the west, and a furious blast of sleet and hail drove full in our faces, icy cold, and urged with such demoniac vehemence that it felt like a storm of needles. It was curious to see the horses. They faced about in extreme displeasure, holding their tails like whipped dogs, and shivering as the angry gusts, howling louder than a concert of wolves, swept over us. Wright's long train of mules came sweeping round before the storm like a flight of brown snowbirds driven by a winter tempest. Thus we all remained stationary for some minutes, crouching close to our horses' necks, much too surly to speak, though once the captain looked up from between the collars of his coat, his face blood red, and the muscles of his mouth contracted by the cold into a most ludicrous grin of agony. He grumbled something that sounded like a curse, directed, as we believed, against the unhappy hour when he had first thought of leaving home. The thing was too good to last long, and the instant the puffs of wind subsided, we erected our tents and remained in camp for the rest of a gloomy and lowering day. The emigrants also encamped near at hand. We, being first on the ground, had appropriated all the wood within reach, so that our fire alone blazed cheerfully. Around it soon gathered a group of uncouth figures, shivering in the drizzling rain. Conspicuous among them were two or three of the half-savage men who spend their reckless lives in trapping among the Rocky Mountains, or in trading for the fur company in the Indian villages. They were all of Canadian extraction. Their hard, weather-beaten faces and bushy mustaches looked out from beneath the hoods of their white capotes with a bad and brutish expression as if their owner might be the willing agent of any villainy. And such, in fact, is the character of many of these men. On the day following we overtook Kersley's wagons, and thenceforward for a week or two we were fellow travelers. One good effect, at least, resulted from the alliance. It materially diminished the serious fatigue of standing guard, for the party being now more numerous, there were longer intervals between each man's turn of duty. End of chapter 6